An ex-con suspected of trying to kill two teenage girls in Fremont is due in court today. A groundbreaking ceremony today is good news for commuters traveling between Contra Costa and Solano counties. And our residents are reacting to the First Lady's listening tour in upstate New York. It's all next on the new news. Live from the award-winning Channel 2 Newsroom, the new news. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Frank Somerville. And I'm Tori Campbell. Police say the conditions of two Fremont teenagers brutally attacked and left for dead have greatly improved. And today, both suspects in that attack are behind bars. And one is due in court for the first time this afternoon. Diane Garazzi is live in Fremont with the very latest. Diane? Tori, 22-year-old Donald Paul Gatson is expected to be arraigned in Fremont at 2 o'clock this afternoon. He was transferred into the custody of Fremont police last night after being arrested earlier in the afternoon in San Francisco. Gatson will face charges of parole violation in addition to the seven felonies against his alleged accomplice. 18-year-old Matthew Mark Kozowski yesterday was charged with attempted murder, kidnapping, armed robbery, and carjacking. Police say the two stabbed an 18 year old and 15 year old girl near Fremont leaving them for dead. The victims are steadily recovering in the hospital. Nurses call it a 180 degree turnaround. Police interviewed the younger victim and hope to get more information from both today. So we need to do a more in-depth interview with them. We haven't had a chance to do that, so that needs to be accomplished. We're also still following up on leads and the tips that people have called in to us because we have a lot of holes in this story that we need to be able to fill in and put together. Like We need to put together the time frame from when the girls contacted these males at 2 a.m. until they were found at 7.30 in the morning. That has got to be put together. Francisco's UN Plaza yesterday, noticing the distinctive five-point star tattoo on the back of his head. He snapped this picture as federal police arrested Gatson and said he was thrilled to be of help. I didn't notice anything until he turned his head and looked in the opposite direction. That's why I saw a notice of five star on his head. The night before, I saw his picture on the news, and the five star caught my attention. So I asked my friend, I sort of casually, to go find a cop. I told him what the situation was. I told him to go find a cop, and he did. The families of the suspects say both Gatson and Kozlowski came from troubled pasts. If convicted, both men could spend the rest of their lives in prison without the possibility of parole. Reporting live in Fremont, I'm Diane Garazzi. Frank Torrey, back to you. All right, Diane. Police are going over a truckload of new evidence in the death of four-year-old Janique Williams. It was seized last night after detectives served a search warrant at the house where Janique's body was discovered. She was found at the bottom of a pool 24 hours after she was reported missing. Police spent six hours at the house last night and took away several boxes of material. Police won't say what they're looking for or what they found in their six-hour search. There was at least three or four cop cars, and then there was unmarked cop cars around here, and then the big van, and there was, there was, yeah, there was a lot of people out here last night. Police are also re-interviewing family members who were at the house when Janique disappeared, and a man, the man who found her body says it didn't appear she had been in the water very long. In another development, according to court documents, Janique's stepfather, you see him there, pleaded guilty to having sex with a minor back in the early 1980s, but it's important to note that at this time, no one has been named as a suspect in Janique's death. President Clinton is wrapping up his tour of America's most impoverished areas. Today, he's visiting the Watts neighborhood in Los Angeles, the location of riots back in 1965. The president's focus will be on training and hiring poor youth for high-skilled jobs. KTVU's Tracy Mitchell is live in Washington, D.C. now with more on the president's trip. Afternoon, Tracy. Well, good afternoon, Frank and Tory. President Clinton is in Los Angeles. He's speaking to students there right now, talking about investing in their future and creating opportunities for them. Hello. President Clinton confronts a challenge today on the south side of Los Angeles. The area was left behind in America's economic boom. Today, the president is in Watts, a community scarred by race riots nearly 30 years apart. Last night, we had a... For many, the flames and the fury are frozen in time. Today, the neighborhoods are still trying to recover. Watts is a nice place. It always has been a nice place. It's also a poor place. Poverty here is high, and unemployment is even higher. But there are signs of development, racial mixture, and upward mobility. There's a churning real estate market in South L.A. Even though folks might say, well, but that's a poor ghetto, whatever. Dealing with technology. How are you? 
Today, President Clinton, former basketball player Magic Johnson, and California's governor visited a school's youth training center. I think it's a good opportunity, and it's very important. Students demonstrated their computer skills. President Clinton says he wants to invest in L.A.'s youth. He's putting together public and private money to help young people develop the skills they need to get high-tech jobs. I have believed from the beginning of my tenure as president that in order for the American economy to really work and in order for the American society to work, every American should believe that he or she had a chance to be a part of it. And President Clinton says the disadvantaged youth in Los Angeles should be a part of it. That's why he is expected to announce an $8 million initiative to help them find jobs in the future. That's the very latest from Washington. I'm Tracy Mitchell. Frank and Tori, back to you. Thank you, Tracy. First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton is keeping her ears wide open as she swings through upstate New York on what's being billed as a listening tour. The First Lady on her first visit to the Empire State since forming her Senate Exploratory Committee is hearing from voters on issues ranging from education to health care. At a Cooperstown hospital, she was praised for discussing ways to make health care more affordable for New Yorkers in poor rural areas. I remain concerned that we have more uninsured people in America today uh, than we did when uh, my husband took office and we started a national conversation about uh, health care and how the system could be uh, enhanced or reformed. And I wanted to come today to listen from the experts, uh, the people who are on the front lines of thinking about uh, and delivering uh, and receiving uh, health care and paying for health care. Tomorrow, Mrs. Clinton is off to Syracuse before she wraps up her visit with a fundraiser in the state capital of Albany. One day after a jury in Florida handed U.S. cigarette makers their biggest setback yet, lawyers are back in court preparing for the second phase of the unprecedented case. Florida jurors found the nation's five largest cigarette makers liable yesterday for making a defective product that causes emphysema and cancer. The plaintiffs are seeking at least $200 billion in damages. They say manufacturers conspire to cover up the dangers of smoking. Today, lawyers are mapping out what direction they'll take in the damages phase of the case, and the judge says he'll decide by Monday when that second phase of the trial will begin. Crowded skies and overbooked planes are pretty typical for the summer travel season, but it appears that's causing more and more passengers to get involuntarily bumped from their flights. The U.S. Department of Transportation says the number of flyers bumped rose 55% compared to last year. That translates to about 17,000 passengers. There is also a rise in consumer complaints about air travel in general. The airlines say they want to make sure there are no empty seats, so they overbook the flights. Now some airlines will reportedly use new passenger forecasting software to help improve the situation. Hundreds of dock workers in the Port of Oakland are back on the job today after a two-day walkout. But there is still work to be done on the new contract for longshoremen, so the labor dispute is not entirely over. Mark Curtis is live in Oakland now with more. Mark? Tori and Frank, we are told that uh, most of the estimated 1,400 dock workers are indeed back on the job today, and that means the port uh, of Oakland is in full operation. The bottom line, uh, work is resuming after most of the port sat idle both uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. The work stoppage was caused by a safety demand by union workers. They wanted an extra signal person for each of the port's massive cranes. The union and management are not commenting on how it was resolved, but it was worked out in activity in the the port has resumed. As for any economic harm, port officials say some revenue has been lost, but a long-term economic hit to the entire region was averted. The port receives revenue from the berthage and dockage fees, uh, and it's about $40,000 average per vessel. So if a vessel leaves without discharging its cargo, we lose the revenue stream uh, for the activity uh, by that vessel. But uh, going beyond that, I think you look regionally at our city and, and the region in terms of...